you will hear part of a lecture about tourism in the leisure industry. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 10. In the exam, you would have 40 seconds to look at the questions. Pause the recording for 40 seconds now. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 10. In today's lecture, we'll begin with an overview of the impact of tourism on the societies and cultures of the host area. Then we'll look at some case studies. One model for the socio-cultural impact of tourism has been provided by Doxy. You'll find a reference in your reading list. He called his model the Iridex. That's a contraction of Irritation Index, and it attempts to show how the attitudes of local people to tourists and tourism change over the years. Doxy identifies four stages. He calls the first stage euphoria, happiness, because initially the tourists are regarded as a novelty, and because of this they're welcomed by everyone in the host area. But as well as that, there's another reason for the people in the host community to welcome tourists. Local people realise that tourism brings scope for economic benefits. As tourist development begins to increase, however, local interest in the visitors becomes sectionalised. That means that some sections of the local population become involved with tourists, while others don't. And it is increasingly the case that commercial rather than social factors are influencing relationships between tourists and the host community. People are less interested in the tourists for their own sake. Doxy calls this stage apathy. If development continues to increase, apathy may change to annoyance. What's causing this? Well, development of the tourist area may start to spiral up out of control and this is often accompanied by congestion, which is going to make life difficult for local people. So the policy makers, the government, the local authorities and so on, provide more infrastructure for the area, more roads, more car parks and so on, to try to help cope with the influx of tourists. But the lives of the local people are made increasingly difficult, and in the final stage of the model, annoyance has turned to antagonism and open hostility to the tourists. And now, all the detrimental changes to lifestyles in the host area are, fairly or unfairly, seen as due to the tourists. Well, this sort of pathway is certainly a fairly good reflection of what happens in some tourist destinations. But Doxy's model has drawn a number of criticisms. The most significant is that it suggests a very negative attitude to the socio-cultural effects of tourism. The fact that the model is unidirectional, that it only works in one direction, seems to suggest that decline in the host-visitor relationship is inevitable. Now, in practice, fortunately, things aren't always quite like that. If you look at real situations, you'll see that the relationships between local people and tourists are rather more complicated and prone to greater variation than this model suggests, so the model is really rather oversimplified. In fact, studies have highlighted quite a few positive effects of tourism. For example, Doxy's model doesn't look at the effects on the tourists themselves. They may well benefit from increased understanding of the host society and culture. Then, Traditional crafts in the host area may be revitalised because tourism provides new markets, such as the souvenir trade, for example. 
So, instead of these traditional skills being lost, local people are encouraged to develop them. There may also be more long-lasting changes, which actually lead to the empowerment of both groups and individuals in the host area. For example, tourism creates openings for employment for women, and through giving them a chance to have a personal income, it allows them to become more independent. In addition, because tourism tends to work through a very few languages that have worldwide usage, those working in the tourist industry may be encouraged to acquire new languages, and this will empower them through providing wider access to globalized media and improving their job prospects in a wider context. Right, now we'll take a short break there and then we'll look at a couple of case studies and see how far the points we've discussed so far apply to them. Now turn to section 2 on page 4 of your listening test booklet. Section 2 You will hear a recorded message giving information about an animal park. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully to the first part of the message and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the Australian Wildlife Park Information Line. The Australian Wildlife Park is very proudly owned and operated by an Australian family, John and Amanda Brooks, who operate the Australian Wildlife Park with their children, David and Sandra. The family doesn't receive any government assistance. It's solely funded by tourists visiting the park. Thank you for your support and assistance. When the Brooks family purchased the Australian Wildlife Park in 1987, the park housed a small collection of animals and birds on a modest five acre or two hectare property. A few years later, the park doubled in size when the family purchased the adjoining property. Also, the collection of animals started to boom. In May 2003, the family designed and built a new park in the public open space. Once again, more than doubling in size. The park now features about 200 species with more than 2,000 head of animals, birds and reptiles. Regarding the entry fee, adults pay $23, children aged 3 to 14 pay $10, age pensioners are $17 and students are $16. One of the great things about the Australian Wildlife Park is that all of the attractions are included in the entry fee. No extra money is needed around the park, so make the most of your experience. All shows, talks, photo opportunities and animal food are included in your entry fee. In addition, the Australian Wildlife Park is open every day of the year, from 9am to 5.30pm, except Christmas Day, 25th of December. Before the final part of the message, you now have 20 seconds to look at questions 16 to 20. Now answer questions 16 to 20. Several attractions are available to visitors to the Australian Wildlife Park. Firstly, you can meet the koalas between 10am and 4.30pm. Here, people can view the koala colony in a natural environment. Another attraction is to feed the kangaroos between 9am and 5.30pm. Visitors can take a walk through the kangaroo enclosure, viewing them in a natural environment. Kangaroo food is provided and the kangaroos are very friendly. Also enjoyable are the wombats. At 11am, 2pm and 3.45pm, there are interactive shows where the team is delighted to introduce you to these popular animals. 
Other attractions that may interest you are an interactive farmyard, suitable for children of all ages. Animal food is provided and the animals are very friendly. In addition, the working farm is where the country comes to town. Visitors can milk a cow, bottle feed a lamb, watch farm dogs gathering the sheep. All the excitement of a real Australian farm. When they ask for volunteers, be sure to put your hand up. Everyone can get involved. We at the Australian Wildlife Park hope all our visitors have an enjoyable time. See you soon. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Test 1. Section 3. You will hear a woman called Phoebe, who is training to be a teacher, talking to her tutor called Tony about research she has done in a school. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 25. So, how did you get on with your school-based research, Phoebe? Well, it was exhausting, but really valuable. Good. What was the specific focus you chose? My title is Attitudes Towards Study Among 11 to 12-year-old Pupils. Right, and what made you choose that focus? Well, <laughs> that's a bit difficult. Lots of my classmates decided on their focus really early on, mainly on the basis of what they thought would help in their future career, you know, in their first year's teaching. So that's what helped you decide? Actually, it was that I came across a book written by experienced teachers on student attitudes, and that motivated me to go for the topic. OK. So what were your research questions or issues? Well, I wanted to look at the ways students responded to different teachers, particularly focusing on whether very strict teachers made teenagers less motivated. And from your research, did you find that was true? No, not from what I saw, you know, from my five days observation, talking to people and so forth. OK. We'll talk about the actual research methods in a moment, but before that, can you briefly summarise what your most striking findings are? Well, what really amazed me was the significant gender differences. I didn't set out to focus on that, but I found that boys were much more positive about being at school. Girls were more impatient. They talked a lot about wanting to grow up and leave school. Very interesting. Yeah, it is. From doing the research, it was clear to me that you might start out to focus on one thing, but you pick up lots of unexpected insights. Right. Did you get any insights into teaching? Yes, certainly. I was doing a lot of observations of the way kids with very different abilities collaborate on certain tasks, you know, help each other. And I began to realise that the lessons were developing in really unexpected ways. So what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I know it's necessary for teachers to prepare lessons carefully, but it's great if they also allow lessons to go their own ways. Good point. Now, I'm really pleased to see you doing this. Analysing and drawing conclusions based on data. But surely this isn't proper data. Because it's derived from such small-scale research. Well, as long as you don't make grand claims for your findings, this data is entirely valid. Mm. I like the way you're already stepping back from the experience 
and thinking about what you've learned about research. Well done. But I know I could have done it better. As you become more experienced, you'll find ways to reduce the risk of difficulties. OK. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, let's look in more detail at how you gathered your data. Let's start with lesson observation. Well, it generally went quite smoothly. I chose my focus and designed my checklist. Then teachers allowed me into their classes without any problems, which surprised me. It was afterwards that the gruelling work started. Yeah, it's very time-consuming, isn't it? making sense of analysing your observation notes. Absolutely. Much more so than interview data, for example. That was relatively easy to process, though I wanted to make sure I used a high-quality recorder to make transcription easier. And I had to wait until one became available. Right. And did you interview some kids as well? In the end, yes. I talked to ten, and they were great. I'd imagined I'd be bored listening to them, but... So it was easy to concentrate? Sure. One of the teachers was a bit worried about the ethics, you know, whether it was right to interview young pupils, and it took a while for him to agree to let me talk to three of the kids in his class, but he relented in the end. Good. What other methods did you use? I experimented with questionnaires, but I really regret that now. I decided to share the work with another student, but we had such different agendas it ended up taking twice as long. That's a shame. It might be worth you reflecting on ways you might improve on that for future projects. You're right, yeah. OK. And the other thing I did was stills photography. I didn't take as many pictures as I'd hoped to. Lack of time? It's pretty easy just snapping away, but I wanted each snap to have a purpose, you know, that would contribute to my research aims, and I found that difficult. Well, that's understandable, but remember... That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear a talk given by a guest lecturer in the Continuing Education Department. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Good evening. I'd like to thank the Continuing Education Department for hosting this series of lectures on People Behind the Names You Thought Were Fiction. Welcome to this talk on The Grand Old Duke of York. I'm sure you're all familiar with the old nursery rhyme, The Grand Old Duke of York, He Had Ten Thousand Men, he marched them up to the top of the hill, and he marched them down again, and so on. But did you know that the Duke of York, immortalised in this popular song, was actually Frederick Augustus, second son of King George III of England and Queen Charlotte? He achieved fame in this way because of the humiliation he suffered at the hands of the French during the Revolutionary Wars at the end of the 18th century. Frederick was born on the 16th of August, 1763, and from the age of 17 
he had been trained as a soldier. When war broke out between England and France in 1793, his father, the king, insisted that he should command the British contingent that was being dispatched to Flanders to cooperate with the Austrians and the Dutch. The Duke was a brave soldier, but remember he was only thirty at the time. Not only was he young, but he was also inexperienced in battle, and was unable to cope with the enthusiastic French Revolutionary Army. He was let down by his allies, too, and in spite of the arrival of ten thousand fresh troops from England, his campaigns were a disaster. He was driven out of Dunkirk in September 1793. Flanders in May 1794, and Belgium in July 1794. Finally, during the winter of 1794 to 1795, his army retreated to the border of Hanover, and, with his unsuccessful campaigns over, the Duke returned to England. It was after this military fiasco that the Duke of York came to be, rather unkindly, satirised in song. Would you believe, despite all this, King George III arranged his son's promotion to the position of Commander-in-Chief of the Army in 1798, and in the following year he was appointed to command an army sent to invade Holland. Again he was unsuccessful, and this confirmed the general opinion that he was not capable of commanding an army in the field. Nevertheless, the rhyme is a bit cruel and harsh, because it doesn't take into account the nature of the soldiers who served with Frederick. All the blame for lack of success should not have been attached to the Duke alone, because the army he had under his command was made up from what is commonly described as the scum of the earth. This is a somewhat offensive term used to refer to a group of people regarded as despicable and worthless. Who were they, these ordinary soldiers? Well, they were mostly vicious, brutal ex-convicts, or raw recruits, and elderly men. The officers who commanded them were all untrained as military men. In fact, they were anybody who could afford to buy a commission. Uh, but here's the really great thing that, unfortunately, the Duke of York is not remembered for. He realised that this was a hopeless kind of army, and he set about improving conditions in order to recruit higher-quality soldiers. He introduced padres. Are you familiar with the term? No? Well, let me explain. You see, members of the British Armed Forces are generally Christians of one denomination or another, and a padre is a Christian cleric or chaplain who ministers to the soldiers and attends to their spiritual needs without belonging to any particular grouping within the Christian faith. Now, where was I? Yes, Frederick introduced padres, doctors, and veterinary surgeons to the battlefield. Why vets? To attend to the horses, of course. Remember, we're talking about late 18th century battlefields. He was also the founder of the Royal Military College for the Training of Officers at Sandhurst. Yes, the very same one where the princes and other members of the royal family receive their military training today. Frederick also founded the Duke of York's school in London for sons of soldiers killed in battle. His name is perhaps better commemorated by this school in Chelsea than by the column that stands at the top of Waterloo Steps in St James's Park. In 1807, the Duke was involved in a scandal with a woman and, as a result, resigned as Commander-in-Chief but he was reinstated in 1811 by his elder brother, the Prince Regent, who later became George IV of England. He continued in this post until his death in 1827. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Before the exam here are some tips for you to get good band score and writing task 1. What you should do and what you must avoid in academic writing task 1. You should to do following. Use the appropriate words for the functions expressed in the graph for a graph that shows trend use the words that describe the trends. Second thing is that you should write a complex sentences and try to write a variety of sentences. Third one is that do not describe all the data when there are more graphs or more fields of data given in the question, group the information probably and combine them in a proper sentences. Number four you should use linking words and connectors to link your information logically. These are some tips to how to get good band score in your writing task 1 so hope you understand. Let's talk about writing task 2. What you should do while writing the task 2. Number 1 Use only formal language and formal language is not at all entertained in writing task 2. Number 2 Please read the essay at least 3-4 times. Number 3 Please follow the points given earlier before you start writing. Number 4 Write at least 4 paragraph in your essay whereas the first is introduction the next two will be from the body and the last will contain the conclusion of your essay. Last Number 5 If you want a high band score please write to use complex sentences in your writing. One. Hello, I'm Claire, and your name is Wayne. Okay, fine. And you're from Taiwan. Is that your identification? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. First, then, a few questions about you and your life. Yeah. Let's talk about your family. Do you come from a large or a small family? Well, it's not a large or it's not a small, but just a medium one. Okay. We got six members in my family. Okay. And um, do all your family live in the same town or city? No, no, they, they separate. Right. How often do you see your brothers and sisters? Well, usually I m meet my brother so three times a year, mm -hmm. and um, I meet my sister once a year because one of my sisters now is living in Canada. Ah, oh, I see. Do you have a lot in common with them? Oh, no, I don't think so. Especially in personality, we are quite different uh -huh. because one of my brothers is a businessman. Right. Um, is it okay to talk about your weekends? Okay. Are your weekends generally busy or relaxed? Oh, relaxed. Sometimes busy um, for my paper submission. Uh -huh. um, what kind of things do you usually do at the weekend? Well, watching TV, well, because uh, that will 
you know, help me to improve my English. Mm-hmm. And then uh, I play golf and the jogging. And um, what would you like to do in your time off if you could choose? Uh, I would like to play golf because here it's quite cheaper uh-huh. <laughs> to play golf. Do you ever go away on your days off? Sometimes, but uh, most of the time I uh, I just go to c- c- city center or I just go to the beach. All right. Let's continue by talking about exercise and fitness. Okay. What kind of outdoor activities or exercise do you like? Oh, I like uh, tennis, I like play golf, um, and the jogging. Are there any sports you don't like? No, I appreciate all kind of sports. Um, for example, cricket. Yeah. For example, so- soccer. Uh huh. And. Um, do you think it's important to keep fit? Yes, of course, it's very important to give me energy and to make me health. Mm-hmm. What are the best ways to keep fit? Well, I think the best way to, is to make a, a specific time every day, In, for example, in Part two. 6 p.m., mm. Now I'm to going to give you a piece of paper jogging. with a topic on it. And uh, yeah. a Please long talk time, about the topic that would for become one to two habit. minutes. Mm, mm. But before you talk, you can have one minute to plan. You can write notes if you want to. Is that okay? Yeah. Here's some paper for your notes. And this is the topic. Please describe an important year in your life. Okay, don't forget, you only have one to two minutes for your talk, so I might stop you when the time is up. Ready to start? Yeah. Well, I think uh, the most important year in my life is when I study MBA degree in the, in, in the University of Howe U- in UK. And that experience gave me a um, culture shock a real cultural shock. I r- noticed that um, Mexican people speak Spanish. And one of my, I remember one of my Spanish classmates, she can't differentiate, differentiate Thailand and Taiwan. And uh, another experience is when I went to a British family in the Christmas holiday. And that family it, um, didn't know where the location of Taiwan is. And uh, the family, they didn't have idea about Taiwan. That gave me a real sh- cultural shock because from the American point of view, most of the American or Canadian, Canadian people, they know the Taiwan situation, but uh, from the Western, from the European, uh, from the British point of view, they are not uh, have the same idea. That so that really gave me a cultural shock. So I noticed that uh, if we evaluate uh, different uh, issues, we have to judge from the international point of view, 
that's very important for me right now. Thank you. Did you keep a diary or something in writing to remember that year? Oh, I didn't. Uh, well, that was very pity. <laughs> Part three. Okay. You talked about things you remember from an important year in your life. Now, I'd like to talk about some general questions connected to memory and the past. How important do you think it is to know your family history? Well, I don't think it's very important. Well, This is uh, this probably because mm, my experience. If um, one family, one family, his their history is uh, doing business, that would be important for the for the other family, the other members of the family to learn how to do in business. But for me, this is as a, a study um, in the academic field. It's just work by myself, so I don't think the family history will be very, very important for me. Mm -hmm. What are the best ways to keep a family history alive for people, for future members of your family? Do you think? Well, uh, you say the the best way. Mm. Oh well, if. Um, if this uh, family has a glory history, of course it should be uh, learned. But um, I have two academic vocabulary have to mention here. One is uh, learn, the other one is unlearn, which means to learn new things and unlearn the past success. Because the family history, it's it's a kind of past tense. Mm. So people should uh, learn new things and unlearn the past success. That would be better. And are you not curious about your history? No, I don't think so. Be uh, because uh, my family uh, came from China, but uh, most of uh, my family uh, didn't uh, haven't. Gone to China, so it's a it's a not a big image for me to to, to learn and or, or to, to learn something from that history. Uh -huh. Do you think it's important to study and understand the history of one's country? Yes, of course, um, because history gives us a lesson that um, makes us uh, the same situation won't happen again. Yeah. What? What? For example. Well. Um, for example, um, in now the, there is a conflict, you know, between Taiwan and China. The separation is just f only fourteen years, but um, from a long term of view, the his they are two very long this long period of separation in China. Each has a 400 years separation, but uh, finally the dynasty, the China, has been united. Hmm. And, and why do you think studying history has become less popular these days? Well, I think this is probably because of the educational system. Because most of the teachers, they just cram knowledge into the brain of the students. So the students don't like history It's because it's very boring. Um, how do you think we could encourage young people to become interested in history? Mm, I think the teachers should uh, teach students from a longitudinal perspective to compare with a different dynasty, to compare with a different countries, that would be 
more interesting. And should they only learn about Chinese history? No, no, of course not. Uh, they should uh, learn all the history in the world. Uh, for example, uh, the recent uh, uh, United, United States against uh, Afghanistan, most of people don't realize the history right. of, uh, of, of the Afghanistan. Uh-huh. Well, that sounds very interesting. But the interview has ended now. So thank you very much for talking to me. You're welcome.